The world of geopolitics is complex. It encapsulates foreign policy, defense, trade, and culture. These can have ripples that can be felt all around the planet. With that, we welcome you to The Global Detail, a podcast where we go beyond borders and behind the headlines to stories that impact the world. Our goal is to peel the onion and explore the various diverse layers through riveting interviews with experts and stalwarts. I'm Akshob Gerda Das. And co-piloting this journey, I'm Brendan Duke. Let's get into it. The end of the Cold War left the United States of America as an unrivaled superpower. With its military might and tremendous soft power in the form of cultural exports like movies and music. However, in the early years of the 21st century, a new player emerged on the world stage. The People's Republic of China. Former Chinese President Deng Xiaoping famously summed up his nation's strategy as, hide your strengths and bide your time. With ambitious projects such as the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI for short, and the combative model of wolf warrior diplomacy, it appears that China has ceased biding its time and is ready to reveal its strength in unapologetic fashion under the leadership of its current president, Xi Jinping. This all comes at a time when the United States is undeniably more divided than at any time in its history outside of its civil war. The Global Detail spoke with Ali Wine, a senior analyst with the Eurasia Group's global macro practice, to break down both the challenges and the opportunities that come from China rising up to the status of a superpower. You and I live in Washington, D.C., and um, I live right by the zoo, and I noticed the other day, and this made for a good introduction to an op-ed. Part of me it just feels that this is 50 years of the pandas in Washington Zoo. And that's no coincidence, because 1972 is when U.S.-China Dayton took place. And sure. for those unfamiliar, Pat Nixon, in a conversation with Cho and Lai in Beijing, uh, was instrumental in bringing the pandas over. And I suppose that's why I want to ask you, talk us about the U.S.-China evolution in 50 years, because the pandas are a harbinger of when things are propitious when Beijing, you get pandas. And when things gets a little sour, as they have in the last few weeks, China threatened to pull back pandas. So perhaps a very simple question to a complicated answer. Map out 50 years of U.S.-China relations in the limited opening five minutes. <laughs> well, I, I'll do the best that I can. It, it's, it's an extraordinarily important question. It's also an extraordinarily difficult question. Uh, and obviously because, because we are, as you said, marking the... 50 years of the U.S. opening to China, there's a lot of, and, and properly, there's a lot of sort of relitigation. Uh, did the United States get it wrong in its policy towards China? Did the United States get its policy wrong? Did the United States, in broad brush strokes, get its policy right? Where might the United States have taken a different course? And and one of the difficulties that's intrinsic to any, any kind of historical relitigation is that uh, counterfactuals are useful, they are important, they're stimulating, but in counterfactual scenarios, unlike unlike real world scenarios, or unlike real world history, in the counterfactual scenario, um, you don't have to deal with surprises, you don't have to deal with shocks, you don't have to deal with divergences between your best laid plans and the execution of those plans. And so the counterfactual, it's it's illuminating, but I think that it also, it's it, I think if taken too far, it can do a bit of a disservice. And it, it's all a long-winded way of saying that even as we rightly relitigate what the United States might have done differently in approaching China, I, I think that we should be cautious about overstating uh, how much uh, – we should, we should be cautious in overstating the extent to which an alternative course of U.S. policy would have uh, limited or even preempted altogether the emergence of a significant competitor. Um, so having, having said all of that, so in in the in the late so actually why don't I begin five years before 1972 and let's go to 1967 when of course Richard Nixon he pens his famous essay in foreign affairs advocating for essentially the contours of what becomes known as 
uh, engagement, but hedging. And the idea being, uh, so as Nixon says, so when Nixon wrote his essay in 1967, at the time, I, I believe Nixon says in his essay at the time, uh, China's population was roughly 800 million. So not, not 1.4 billion as it is today, but still a, a massive population. And China in 1967, uh, despite having that massive population, it's, it's, quite isolated, quite impoverished. And, and Nixon makes the argument that it would be unwise for the United States and unwise for the broader international community to allow a country of such proportions to languish indefinitely in such isolation and impoverishment. And so Nixon makes the argument for bringing China in from the cold. But of course, because China was very much under the grip of a revolutionary fervor, uh, Nixon made the argument that as we as we in the United States, as we attempt to bring China in from the cold, we should also hedge against its revolutionary tendencies. Um, and so I think that the United States for really for the better part of the past 50 years has has attempted to bring China in from the cold. But I think that increasingly in recent years, it's attempted to push back more forcefully. Now, what are some of the inflection points in that um, in, in that roughly five decade history? I think one critical inflection, well, well, there are a number of inflection points, but I'll be, I'm going to be very, uh, I'm going to gloss over a lot of history and I'm going to be very uh, reductionist. I think a critical inflection point, not only in the United States, but also in China comes in 2008. So 2008, of course, uh, is the year of the global financial crisis. It's also the year when Beijing hosts uh, the Olympics and the onset of the global financial crisis and China's hosting of the, the Olympics, they take place in, in uh, very close proximity. So 2008 is a year when uh, maybe not a critical mass of China's foreign policy establishment, but a, a, non, a not trivial uh, segment of China's foreign policy establishment begins to wonder whether China is inexorably resurgent and whether the United States is in terminal decline. So 2008 is an important year. And of course, many U.S. observers also begin to question whether a power transition has begun in earnest between Washington and Beijing. Uh, then you know, late 2012, early 2013, uh, when Xi Jinping takes the helm uh, as the leader of China. Now, Xi Jinping is obviously cut from very different cloth. He's cut from a very different cloth than his predecessors. And he's far more assertive uh, than Hu Jintao. Uh, he, his crucible experiences are, far, uh, are, are, are very different from those of, of Hu Jintao. And Xi Jinping immediately, um, he puts a much more a confident imprimatur on China's trajectory. Uh, he, he talks about moving... He talks about his ambition to move China closer to center stage in world affairs. Um, he takes a much more assertive line in foreign policy. Uh, and then also at home, he takes a much more authoritarian line. He cracks down much more aggressively on Chinese non-governmental organizations, much more aggressively on Chinese uh, activists and dissidents. Uh, he also takes a much more skeptical line uh, towards foreign non-governmental Organization. So I think late 2012, early 2013 is another inflection point that begins to make U.S. observers more apprehensive of China's trajectory at home and abroad. And then I would say, uh, you know, 2015, 2016, when uh, China's uh, campaign of land reclamation in the South China Sea really begins to pick up in earnest. Uh, it's, it's, again, sends alarm bells, uh, it, or it, it sends off alarm bells in Washington, because keep in mind, and I promise I'll stop in a couple of minutes, um, but keep in mind that uh, Xi Jinping, uh, famously in 2015, he stands next to his counterpart, then uh, US President Barack Obama, and he pledges not to militarize the South China Sea. But then, of course, China does proceed to militarize uh, the South China Sea in direct contravention of that pledge. Um, and 2016, of course, another important inflection point. Uh, many Chinese observers adduced the election of Donald Trump as evidence that America's internal politics are perhaps dysfunctional beyond repair. And they see in they see in kind of the oscillations of uh, and so between 2016 and or 2017 when Donald Trump uh, is is sworn in and in January 2021 when Joe Biden is sworn in as the next American president. Um, Chinese observers adduced the uh, the swings in, in U.S. foreign policy rhetoric and the swings in U.S. foreign policy substance as evidence that the United States was uh, no longer a reliable ally and partner abroad. They adduced those oscillations as evidence that China could uh, poke holes uh, in longstanding U.S. relationships. And so 
So those are some of the inflection points. But in terms of, I, I think, a real so so by the time so before Donald Trump takes takes office, I should say. So let me begin. Let me sort of close there. So I was in the second term of the Obama administration. So this is you know 2013 to 2017. I think that on a bipartisan basis, anxieties had begun to percolate about China's strategic uh, intentions, about China's coercive conduct. Um, the relationship hadn't ruptured fully, but there was, there was certainly growing concern in the United States that interdependence between Washington and Beijing, um, while it had been a stabilizing force, there were concerns that that interdependence had uh, begotten a number of strategic vulnerabilities for the United States. There were concerns that that interdependence had allowed the, uh, China to uh, exploit uh, U.S. openness. Uh, and then, uh, and as I said, you look at sort of Chinese growing Chinese cyber espionage, China's uh, intensifying campaign of land reclamation in the South China Sea. So during the second term of the Obama administration, there were growing concerns uh, that among U.S. observers on a bipartisan basis about the direction of, of U.S. policy towards China, about the direction of Chinese uh, policy towards the United States. And there was a sense that some kind of recalibration or, or correction was overdue. But certainly... And then I think certainly with the, the Trump administration, those anxieties really, the Trump administration not only surfaced those anxieties, but really acted on those anxieties in a very serious way. So it initiates a campaign of tariffs against China in 2018. Its national security strategy and national defense strategy uh, say that uh, great power competition has returned, that China is, is, is an adversary, and that the United States' policy towards China has essentially failed. So, um, and I think that what we see now is that you know, the Trump administration, it surfaced a lot of anxieties, and I think that those anxieties endure uh, on a bipartisan basis. And we see that you know, China it is doubling down on a course of so-called wolf warrior or pandemic era diplom uh, diplomacy that has estranged it from a lot of advanced industrial democracies. Now, the, I think one of the big, there are two big questions to my mind. One is, will China recalibrate its foreign policy at all? And if so, how after the 20th Party Congress, number one? And number two, to what extent is China's foreign policy being, what are the drivers of China's foreign policy? Is China's foreign policy being driven by domestic insecurity? Uh, there are a lot of reports about uh, sort of decelerating Chinese growth, decreasing returns to investment in China's growth model. So is domestic insecurity at play? is confidence at play. Uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, there there is a narrative it, within China's foreign policy establishment that China is inexorably resurgent. Uh, is that narrative driving China's foreign policy? Is it insecurity about an increasingly contested uh, external environment? So you look at the Quad, growing momentum. The, the EU is adopting a different disposition towards China. NATO is recalibrating its disposition towards China. So what are the drivers of China's foreign policy? But again, I, I think that those are questions that, that reasonable observers can uh, debate and dispute, but there are two questions that we should be keeping an eye on. I think you answered my next four to five questions. And I think that's the conundrum of having very erudite guess. You can almost sense what's coming. But uh, you mentioned 2008 Olympics. And that, of course, is a very seminal moment because the two things you mentioned is one, China announcing itself on the great grand scale. The Beijing Olympics was a spectacle. And at the time, the global financial crisis, which perhaps uh, dethroned and the American centrality, the liberal economic order, perhaps, or where the US was on the pantheon of finances. And I know it helped other countries like Australia, because they were so reliant on China. And perhaps that's where the court took a time. But I think what I want to pick from that is the Xi Jinping era, because it's about 10 years ago. And I remember being in China that time when the 19th Congress was taking place, and there was a lot of IR scholars talking about a peace China rise. And clearly that's not happened. And perhaps that's one thing that we may have missed the forest for the trees. Because as you rightly said in the Deng Xiaoping credo of hide your strength and bide your time, Xi has been all iron hand and velvet gloves with uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, militarization of the South China Sea, BRI. If so, what's the Xi model? Is this an inflection point where the 20th Congress coming up and from China, as we know it, has changed? Well, I, I think it's undeniable that, you know, Xi Jinping has, uh, he has 
left a very distinctive imprimatur already on uh, not only Chinese foreign policy, but also uh, Chinese domestic policy. And but I do think that the 20th Party Congress, I mean, the 20th Party Congress is uh, it is shaping up to be a seminal event, not only in, in Chinese politics, but in also in global politics, because barring some catastrophe, uh, it seems virtually certain that Xi Jinping will secure a norm defying the unprecedented third term at the helm of China. And he is positioning himself to rule you know, China basically for as long as he's uh, as long as he's alive, as long as his, you know, his cognitive you know, faculties are um, are are you know, functional. Uh, he is setting himself up to be ruler for life. You know, so long as he is, you know, mentally and and physically capable, he has steadily purged political opponents. His circle of advisors has grown more insular. So now, uh, Xi Jinping's China is not the China is not China in perpetuity. Uh, there will eventually be another leader of China. We don't know the identity of that individual there, but there will eventually be another leader of China. But for the next. I think it's for, I think plausibly for the next uh, decade, two decades, uh, we will be dealing with Xi Jinping. And what I find striking, you know, you mentioned the phrase peaceful rise. What I find striking, if you go back to sort of the famous articulation of uh, China's so-called peaceful rise that was published in Foreign Affairs in 2005, it's quite striking to see how significantly China's external environment today in 2022 differs from the external environment that was envisioned in that famous uh, foreign affairs piece in 2005. Uh, So in 2005, in this articulation of China's so-called peaceful rise, the the hope was that China would enjoy uh, stable relations with its uh, powerful democratic neighbors in uh, in the Asia Pacific, and that it would basically expand this circle of uh, expand this circle of peaceful relations. So with with Europe, with the United States, uh, and there really was a sense that China would, uh, not, that it, not that China wouldn't ruffle any feathers, but that China would, again, it would enjoy a mostly uh, peaceful rise in which it would offer an alternative growth model, an alternative political model in which it would demonstrate that uh, countries of China's proportions and countries that have very different developmental paths could nonetheless uh, contribute to, uh, flourish within, uh, and and ultimately bolster the prevailing international system. Uh, In 2022, uh, China's external environment, now it is true that in 2022, you know, China possesses the world's second largest economy, which which may well become the world's largest economy well before the middle of the century. Uh, but I think that there's a marked gap between China's economic heft on the one hand and its strategic environment on the other. So if you just look at China's strategic environment, take take the quad. Prior to the pandemic, many observers, and I I regret to I regret to say that I was one of those observers. Uh, prior to the pandemic, you know, many observers saw the quad as being kind of one of these geopolitical abstractions that would, would muddle along, but really wouldn't achieve uh, significant momentum. Uh, today, the Quad has clear momentum. Uh, under the under the Biden-Harris administration, uh, the Quad has now convened uh, four times and most recently convened uh, in Tokyo in May. Uh, it has clear momentum uh, militarily, economically, uh, diplomatically, uh, it has clear momentum. It's undertaking more and more initiatives. Uh, Australia, India, Japan, and the United States are increasingly aligned on on security policies and also on economic and technological policies. So the Quad uh, is now uh, a growing headache for a uh, strategic headache for China, uh, Japan, and South Korea. Now, this story doesn't get the kind of attention that it deserves, but it's a very critical story, in, in, at least in my view. Uh, Japan and South Korea owing. Uh, partly to growing concerns over North Korea, but I, I would argue perhaps uh, even in growing measure to concern to share concerns over China's resurgence, uh, Japan and South Korea, despite, you know, despite their long-standing historical animus and mistrust or distrust rather, um, they're taking tentative steps towards uh, a detente of their own. And it's important to keep in mind that one of the major impediments historically to U.S. efforts to rebalance uh, its foreign policy to the Asia Pacific, to strengthen its profile, to strengthen its influence in the Asia Pacific, one of the major impediments historically to those efforts has been that long-standing animosity between Japan and South Korea. But as Tokyo and Seoul move towards a tentative uh, rapprochement, uh, that I, I think that that dynamic will advance U.S. efforts and influence in the Asia Pacific. So China faces a much more contested 
uh, environment, strategic environment in the, the Asia Pacific. The European Union, I think in large part because of the way that uh, China cracked down on Hong Kong because of the really disproportionate sanctions or counter sanctions, rather, uh, that China levied against European parliamentarians, even European think tanks. Uh, those uh, penalties, I, I think, induced a real serious recalibration in important capitals across uh, across the European Union. Uh, perhaps the most striking change, uh, to my mind, um, comes uh, com- you know, originates in NATO. If you look in 2019, 2019, so it's, I believe, December 2019, uh, after uh, a NATO summit in London, uh, the communique that was issued after NATO summit in London in December 2019 marks the fir- marks rather marks the first time that NATO mentioned China in an official document. And if you you recall. That document, I'm, I'm roughly paraphrasing the language, but the, the reference to China was very anodyne. So I think the language is something to the effect of uh, China's rise presents challenges and opportunities for the alliance. And that was that was the extent of the, the mention in the communique. If you look at NATO's most recent uh, strategic concept published just a couple of months ago, the language is much starker. The coverage of China is much more extensive. And NATO says in the strategic concept that I'm roughly paraphrasing again, but China's uh, resurgence, its uh, its stated ambitions and its coercive conduct pose clear challenges for the alliance's values and interests. So a much, much uh, starker uh, change in, in language. And then, of course, the United States on a bipartisan basis is taking a dimmer view towards China. Uh, within Congress, there's growing support for upgrading uh, ties between Washington and Taipei. And so from China's point of view, uh, I think that what China is trying to do is so, so what is China trying to do to offset that pressure? One, uh, I think that it's trying to, and, and Nadege Roland of the National Bureau of Asian Research, she's made this point uh, very, uh, very persuasively. She's, make, she's made the argument that in order to blunt the impact of growing uh, pressure from and growing cohesion among advanced industrial democracies, that China is going to try and deepen its footprint to, across the, the so-called global south, essentially the, the developing world. And by virtue of its Belt and Road Initiative, by virtue of major uh, globally competitive technology companies such as Huawei, uh, China already has significant uh, relationships across the developing world. And Nadej Roland makes the argument that China is going to try to deepen those relationships to offset growing pressure from advanced industrial democracies. So I think that that's one vector of effort that we can expect to see uh, continue, number one. Number two, I think that China will try to to gain more traction for these two reinforcing interlocking narratives that I alluded to earlier. I think that China's leadership wants to promulgate, firstly, the narrative that China is inexorably resurgent, uh, and secondly, the narrative that the United States is in terminal decline. Uh, and the reason that it's trying to gain traction for those narratives is that decision makers or policymakers, I should say, uh, they're driven at least as much by perceptions of the balance of power as they are by realities of the balance of power. And that is to say, even if you believe that those narratives that China's leadership is trying to promulgate, even if you believe that those narratives are analytically overstated, um, if you believe that there's a kernel of truth, if you believe that in due course um, those narratives will uh, will be borne out, uh, that assessment is likely to to shape your thinking. So if so, even if you have apprehensions about China's conduct, even if you have apprehensions about China's intentions, but if you believe those narratives that China's leadership is attempting to promulgate, you likely you'll likely adjust your foreign policy as a result. So I think vector. Uh, vector number two is trying to gain more traction uh, for those for those two reinforcing interlocking narratives, and then I think thirdly is you know China is likely going to try not only to recalibrate certain existing initiatives such as the Belt and Road, and I think we already see that in response to growing uh, fiscal and geopolitical. Uh, difficulties that the initiative is encountering. China is trying to recalibrate the Belt and Road Initiative to make it seem greener, to make it seem more sustainable. But in addition to recalibrating existing initiatives, I think that China is also likely to try and debut new ones that can uh, that can uh, counter or serve as uh, serve as alternatives to those that the United States and the West more broadly promulgate. And I think a good example is the Global Security Initiative uh, that China has been promulgating. So those are three vectors of effort that that I think that China is likely to continue. But uh, but I don't think that we should understate the the difficulties that China will face in achieving its 
ambitions, its strategic ambitions, whatever they may be. Um, however, however sizable its economy is right now, whatever one's belief is in its uh, medium to long-term economic trajectory going forward, but overcoming the strategic distrust that China has engendered is, is not going to be an easy task. Now, I do want to enter one caveat, and I think it's important to enter this caveat. Um, given China's proportions, and when I say proportions, I mean the size of its population, the size of its physical territory, the size of its economy, the size of its military, so on and so forth. Given China's proportions, uh, no country of China's proportions um, could have, uh, you know, could have sustained the resurgence or could have experienced the resurgence that China has without eliciting some level of scrutiny and without eliciting some level of pushback. And that is to say, you know, even if Xi Jinping had endeavored as studiously as possible to um, to hew to Deng Xiaoping's counsel to, to hide your time, to bide your capabilities, it's likely that China, again, just by virtue of its sheer proportions, would have elicited a significant amount of scrutiny and pushback. Having said that, I do think that a lot of the resistance that China has engendered uh, in recent months and recent years is largely self-inflicted. And it's not clear to me that economic heft alone can overwhelm strategic suspicion, particularly when that strategic sus uh, suspicion is concentrated in advanced industrial democracies, advanced industrial democracies that, while not relatively as preeminent as they were at the turn of the century, they nonetheless do wield the balance of global power. So I think that whether Xi Jinping is motivated by confidence, whether he's motivated by anxiety, whether he's motivated by some, uh, you know, some combination of the two, I think that he has his work cut out for him. No, thank you for that, Ali. And uh, and I know you touched on Taiwan, but before I get to Taiwan, I want to ask about the Quad. Um, how does China view minilaterals like the Indo-Pacific Quad, I two, you two, AUKUS? I mean. Is it still seen, while it's not seen as an Asian NATO by the principles involved, does China obviously see it as a security threat? Because fundamentally, for China, it's either as name the dragon without naming the dragon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it, it's interesting. So from, and there's kind of sort of a, you could almost say a, a kind of a, 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 a mirror, a mirror imaging, or kind of a kind of a similar dynamic that's playing out in the United States and China. From from a U.S. perspective, I think it's actually I think that one of the I think it's been very important that the Biden Harris administration, in unveiling whether it's the Indo Pacific Economic Framework, whether it's unveiling AUKUS, whether it's unveiling the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment, whether it's debuting. Uh, its new Africa strategy. I think it's been very important that the Biden Harris administration, in unveiling this, um, what National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has called a, a lattice work of, of, of partnerships, of uh, coalitions, of initiatives, that it's gone to great lengths to um, to present those initiatives on their own merits. And yes, it has mentioned. China, yes, it has mentioned Russia, but I think that it's gone to great lengths to to debut these initiatives on on their own merits. Uh, I think that U.S. officials recognize that because uh, because obviously China is America's principal strategic competitor, because U.S. China strategic competition is intensifying on a global basis, uh, sort of. Uh, geographically, functionally, and so forth. I think U.S. officials recognize that no matter what rhetoric they use when announcing uh, initiatives, no matter uh, no matter how, no matter the lengths to which they go to emphasize that they're debuting these initiatives to affirm America's vision of world order rather than to negate China's vision of world order, they recognize that. I think that most most observers, uh, rightly or wrongly, are going to. Uh, to frame those initiatives as being defined in opposition to China. Uh, and on the flip side, or, or conversely, I think that China, uh, no matter what the United States does, no matter what the West does, uh, but the United States in particular, no matter what the United States does, you know, China is likely to, uh, to frame uh, U.S. initiatives as being defined in opposition to China. So the United States, no matter what it does, um, I think that its initiatives are going to be framed as being oppositional. And China, of course, is going to uh, is going to go to great lengths to define any and all U.S. initiatives as being oppositional to um, you know to China. And so that I think that that kind of uh, those perceptions or misperceptions, whatever your your assessment, but I think that those perceptions are largely. Uh, 
baked in. And I think that China, and I think, and I think here is one of the the real challenges for the United States and China, you know, going forward. Um, so in the United States now, on a pretty bipartisan basis, the the belief that China seeks to overtake the United States for global preeminence is. Uh, it's pretty now baked in on a bipartisan basis. So whether you talk to policymakers of both parties, whether you talk to lawmakers of both parties, that assessment is, 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 uh, is, is, uh, is very widely shared. And I think it's all, and I think it's fair to say it's almost universally shared. And then similarly in China, I think if you look at the center of gravity within China's foreign policy establishment, the view is basically, again, it's basically baked in, and it's not clear to me that there are any dissenting views. Uh, the view is basically baked in that the United States, in conjunction with its allies and partners, uh, will stop at no lengths to prevent China's further resurgence. And so when those types of perceptions or assessments, rather, are are calcified, uh, they're very difficult to reverse. And so the question is not so much what can the two countries do to change those perceptions? Because it's not clear to me that realistically there is anything that can be done to change those perceptions. The question is, what can the United States and China do, given the existence of those perceptions in both capitals, what can the two countries do uh, to impose guardrails that prevent escalating competition from morphing into unconstrained rivalry uh, that could, uh, that could, in the worst case, culminate in armed confrontation? What can the two countries do to preserve at least some minimal baseline of cooperation on the transnational challenges that implicate their shared vital national interests. And also what steps can the two countries do to forge what one might call a competitive coexistence or a durable cohabitation? I, you know, one can't, one can never theoretically rule out extreme scenarios. One cannot theoretically rule out the possibility that, uh, that, China might overtake the United States for global preeminence. One cannot rule out the possibility that on the flip side, that the Chinese Communist Party might collapse. Uh, one cannot theoretically rule out the scenarios. But I, I think that the more likely scenario is a more, it, it's it's a much less dramatic scenario. I think that the more likely scenario is that the United States will not be able to achieve a decisive victory over China. And it's not even clear to me, given the level of interdependence between the two countries, what a victory would entail. Um, and I don't think that China will be able to relegate the United States to a position of, uh, to a marginal position in world affairs. I think the United States has a number of competitive advantages that China cannot readily replicate and vice versa. So to me, the most likely scenario is one in which the United States and China, um, begrudging, you know, however low they might be to admit it, um, neither a country in my, my assessment is likely to quote unquote come out on top. I think that they're going to have to contend with one another in perpetuity. And if you accept that proposition or that hypothesis rather that those two countries are going to have to contend with one another in perpetuity, then you really do need to be thinking about uh, what competitive coexistence looks like. Now, um, I think that one of the difficulties from the U.S. perspective, psychologically, is that in our and when I say our, I'm now referring to America. Uh, in our in our previous experiences with major external competitors, those confrontations have have had decisive outcomes. So, if you look at our confrontation with Nazi Germany, or I'm sorry, with Imperial Japan and then Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany suffered decisive military defeats. If you look at our nearly half century long struggle with the Soviet Union the Soviet Union disintegrated in decisive fashion. It's not clear to me that either of those types of decisive resolutions is going to obtain in America's confrontation with China. And so I think that we need to be thinking much harder about what competitive cohabitation looks like. We need to be uh, we need to be recalibrating our diplomacy around the task of forging a competitive coexistence rather than thinking about a decisive victory. Um, Ali, that's a pertinent point there and com- competitive coexistence. Um, I think the elephant in the room you would be Taiwan, given the sure. nadir in recent US-China relations came with House Speaker Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. And with that, uh, China obviously sees Taiwan as a renegade province. And while nothing has changed from US foreign policy, do we, one, have a problem of one China policy, but a two China diplomacy? And secondly, there have been comparisons after Putin's invasions of Ukraine about the threat that Taiwan faces. Uh, while it may not be like for like, but both China and Russia are revanchist powers. So is there a concern 
as well that Ukraine, like Taiwan, is could be a sitting duck? So this comparison, um, you know, this comparison has gotten a lot of play for good reason, um, and I think it's it's gotten it's gotten that much more play uh, now. The Ukraine Taiwan comparison, the Ukraine Taiwan comparison, I should say, and we, we all know it, it didn't. It didn't begin on February 24th, 2022. The Ukraine-Taiwan comparison is a long-standing one, and it long predates uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But it obviously, it's gained much more traction because many observers didn't think that Russia actually would invade Ukraine. And the thinking was that the thinking among many observers, at least I think predominantly in, in the West, the thinking among many Western observers was that given that Russia would elicit such significant or would incur such significant consequences for invading Ukraine, uh, military, diplomatic, and economic, that surely if if Russian President Vladimir Putin were doing a quote-unquote rational cost-benefit um, uh, calculus, that he would determine that uh, – it would be far. It would be far better for Russia's uh, strategic outlook for Russia to continue applying multifaceted pressure vis-a-vis Ukraine rather than launching a full-fledged invasion. And yet, uh, defying that uh, putative uh, or defying that putatively rational um, sort of cost-benefit analysis, Russia went ahead and invaded Ukraine. And we now are well over six months into this brutal, uh, expanding war of attrition between. Russia and Ukraine. So obviously, given that Russia invaded Ukraine when many observers predicted or believed that it wouldn't, uh, we have to pay attention to that comparison. Having said so, I think that it's it's also important that we not, um, while we while we make the comparison, I think it's important that we we acknowledge the limits uh, between between the cases. One. I think that the United States attaches far more strategic importance to Taiwan than it does to Ukraine. Uh, And I think that it's important to make that point. Uh, When you see how much the United States has done to support Ukraine, given that the United States attaches vastly more strategic importance to Taiwan, I think that China has to imagine that if it were to attack Taiwan, uh, the U.S. response, military, diplomatic, economic, would be... uh, orders of magnitude more significant than the response that it's presently marshaled uh, in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, number one. Uh, number two, there, there are just the, the logistics involved. Uh, staging an amphibious landing, it's one of the most complicated uh, it's one of the most complicated of all military uh, maneuvers. And staging an amphibious landing is, again, orders of magnitude more difficult uh, logistically than invading a territorially contiguous neighbor. And you know, China, uh, for all of its much vaunted military modernization, I think it's important to remember that the People's Liberation Army hasn't fought in major combat. It hasn't it hasn't fought a major war since 1979. So you can talk a lot about military modernization. You can conceive of invasion in the abstract, but again, uh, the PLA has not been tested. Uh, actually tested in a major way since 1979. So that's, I think that's another important uh, distinction. I think that also, you know, China has to be, China has to recognize that its economic uh, integration in, that its economic integration is in one way, it's a blessing. It's also uh, a curse. So it's a blessing in the sense that when you are, uh, you're far economically larger. I believe the China's economy is 10 times larger than Russia's, maybe even larger. Uh, maybe I think that perhaps even 11 times uh, as large as Russia's. So China's economy is far larger than Russia's. China is also vastly more integrated into the global economy. And that, so the, the size of China's economy and the level of China's integration into the global economy mean that China would probably be far more capable of absorbing whatever economic pushback it would invariably incur by uh, were it to attack Taiwan, uh, but greater integration also means far greater exposure. Uh, recall that after, um, recall that when Russia uh, launched its incursion into Ukraine in 2014 and subsequently annexed Crimea, and the West imposed uh, the West imposed uh, strong sanctions against Russia. Russia became more beholden to China, and Russia spent the interregnum between 2014 and 2022 trying to build up this so-called fortress economy. And I think that what 
uh, what we've seen is that, yes, Russia, for the time being, Russia is blunting the impact of sanctions by uh, you know, via capital controls, via and it's also capitalizing on the on uh, energy spike or energy price spikes. But over the medium to long term, I think that those sanctions are increasingly going to puncture this myth of a so-called uh, fortress, uh, fortress Russian economy. I think that China recognizes that it has a lot more work to do to achieve the economic self-reliance, the technological self-reliance that will be required uh, in order to absorb economic pushback from uh, were to attack Taiwan. So I think that there are a number of, I think that there are a number of differences. You know, I tend to be, um, and, and I think that I'll just make a, a few other, a few other comments. One, while there is growing concern, uh, and I think for understandable reason, while there is growing concern that perhaps China has, uh, drastically revised its timeline for making a move on Taiwan. And there's a sense that perhaps China feels that now sort of the 2020s are its critical you know, decade and that it needs to act now. I think that if you look at official Chinese statements, if you look at, a, um, so if, if you look at official Chinese statements vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, sure. Uh, China is, if you look at its uh, white paper that it released recently on Taiwan, China's rhetoric has certainly become, vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, has certainly become more assertive. And obviously we saw, we've seen that in response to U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, that China uh, has engaged in uh, very dr uh, dramatically destabilizing uh, provocations vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. It stated its intention to now conduct more regular exercises around Taiwan. So China is definitely ramping up the pressure. And yet it isn't clear from official Chinese rhetoric that, China is exhibiting a greater sense of urgency. Uh, it, I, I think that China still assesses, based if you look at it again, its official rhetoric. I think that China still assesses that time is on its side. Uh, I think that China feels that its comprehensive national power is likely to continue growing, uh, not that it's sort of nearing a nearing a peak, but that it's likely to continue growing. I think that China believes that when it comes to dealing with Taiwan. That even though, uh, you know, even though the United States is is strengthening its relationship with Taiwan, even though the Quad is becoming more mobilized militarily, I think that China still feels that the military sort of correlation of forces in the Asia Pacific is still the trajectory is still heading in in China's favor, and so it's not clear to me that China betrays uh, with its conduct or even with its actions that it betrays. Uh, a great sense of urgency around making a move on Taiwan. So I think, so then the real question is, you know, what, you know, what is to be done? Um, obviously, you know, Taiwan needs to do whatever it can to invest in its, in its own self-defense. I think that the United States uh, should be, should continue contributing to Taiwan's ability to uh, defend itself. Um, and I think that importantly, and I'll make one, one last point here, not only in the, uh, not only just sort of in the U.S.-China context, but I want to make a broader point. I think it's very important that the United States not convey to Taiwan a sense that war between that war between the United States and China over Taiwan is inevitable. I think that the great, I think that Taiwan's greatest enemy in many ways is a sense of fatalism that that one that one hears in certain quarters that. War between the United States and China is not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think that that fatalism is irreparably injurious to Taiwan's psyche. I think that the United States and its allies and partners, they need to convince Taiwan that, yes, even though the the Asian Pacific regional security environment is deteriorating, and that even though the U.S.-China relationship is deteriorating, um, I think that Washington needs to, convince, needs to really impress upon Taipei that, Taiwan can continue to grow its economy. It can continue to strengthen its uh, indigenous defenses, that it can continue to grow its profile in the international community, that it can continue to grow its diplomatic heft, and that war is not inevitable. Yes, the security environment is becoming more contested, but war is not inevitable. Um, and I want to make a broader point here, and, th and then I'll stop. Um, it's very important, and I know that this point, it, it, it's hardly some earth-shattering observation, but I think it's very, very important, you know, Akshob, when we talk and, and for all of your listeners, I think it's important for all of us to to remind ourselves of how profoundly ahistorical and how profoundly uh, regrettable it would be uh, 
to believe that war is inevitable. We know we know from history that while certain confrontations between uh, established powers and their and their principal challengers have indeed culminated in armed confrontation, not every or have uh, culminated in armed conflict. Not every confrontation uh, has culminated in armed conflict. So we know from history that the avoidance of great power war is possible, number one. And number two, uh, to believe that war is inevitable is essentially to believe that human agency is non-existent. It's to believe that the decisions that policymakers make have no impact, that policymakers uh, analysts, citizens, and others are essentially hapless bystanders to structural forces that are marching forward uh, and galloping apace. And I think that, that that type of narrative, again, it's ahistorical. It's also, uh, it's immoral. Uh, I think it's, it constitutes an abdication of responsibility. Um, it's, it's an abdication of responsibility to claim that war is inevitable and therefore to throw your hands up in despair and say there's nothing that can be done. There is a lot that can be done. Uh, and I believe that there is much that can be done, uh, can be done, should be done, must be done. And keep in mind, and I promise one last one, then I'll stop. But I, I mentioned history. Uh, you know, before World War I, uh, policymakers uh, and diplomats in Europe who were engaged in brinkmanship, they could, they could claim that not, nothing much would come for the brinkmanship because, again, there had not been a world war. Uh, and then World War I happened. Uh, world War I resulted in the disintegration of three empires. It left uh, approximately 20 million dead. Now, after World War I, uh, the, uh, the world-renowned historian, arguably the foremost historian of the First world, uh, world War, Margaret Macmillan, she said that after World War I in the 1920s, uh, policymakers – at least some policymakers convinced themselves that it was possible with enough enlightenment, with enough uh, taking stock of lessons learned from that calamity. Uh, there were some policymakers who imagined that they could revert back to a pre-World War I status quo. But then we had the Great Depression. Then we had World War II, which left 60 million dead. Um, today's policymakers in the United States and in China they can't feign ignorance, and they shouldn't pretend ignorance about the consequences that might result from comparable brinkmanship today. They're students of World War One, they're students of World War Two, they're students of the Cold War, which, while it didn't result in nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union, it was devastating for many uh, stretches of of the world. So today's policymakers are students of history. They've seen uh, the bloody 20th century, which was the grisliest century in all of human his all of recorded human history. They can't pretend to ignorance. They must do better. They must reclaim their agency to avert a catastrophe in the nuclear era. So Ali, as an academic, you've spent a lot of time looking at great power competition. But one part that academics in the 19th and 20th century didn't have was talking about tech in the geopolitics, the U.S.-China tech war, the battle for some semiconductors, and Taiwan's a world leader in it. And we talk about companies like Foxconn Manufacturing Region, Chinese companies like Huawei and ByteDance who are in the eye of the storm. And they're talking about Chinese companies uh, in violation of patent rights and uh, privacy law. So under the Biden administri administration, are we seeing a policy of um, small yard, high fence? That is the same uh, level of security when assessing China, but not so much of the Asabic Trump era trade war. Yeah, I think that, that I think that that assessment is is fair. Um, I think yeah, I think that assessment is fair. And I think that I think that what what the administration is trying to do, and again, this balancing act is extraordinarily hard, uh, in part because of just the the extant level and multiplicity of U.S. China uh, trade and techno trade and technological interdependence. It's very difficult to get this balancing act right. But there is a recognition that the I guess pre perhaps you could say sort of the pre-2016 configuration of economic interdependence between the United States and China was, was due for a correction. There's also a recognition that too precipitous, uh, to be diving headlong into uh, decoupling and attempting too precipitously and too forcibly to rupture all of the various linkages between the United States and China uh, would also be gravely injurious to the United States. Uh, I, I I bring up this metaphor whenever I get the opportunity, and it's, uh, it's not mine. I wish I could have claimed. I, I, I wish I could claim credit for it, but it comes from the uh, the political economists uh, Henry Farrell and Abraham, New uh, uh, Abraham Newman, who are frequent 
colleagues and co-authors, and they liken China's economy and the global economy to Siamese twins. And as you know, with Siamese twins, if you try to pry them apart and if you're not careful, you risk uh, rupturing, uh, you risk rupturing the organs of both twins. You risk rupturing the circulatory systems of both twins, and you risk the deaths of both twins. Uh, it's a vivid metaphor, but I think it encapsulates the dilemma. The United States and China, having built up um, such a complex, multifaceted web of interdependence um, over you know 35 to 40 years, I will find it difficult to to disentangle fully, and I don't think that they should pursue a full disentanglement. So the question is. Um, when you array all of the various domains in which the United States and China are interdependent for each of those domains, there has to be a question, uh, which, you know, to what extent do we want to scale back our interdependence? What kind of steady state interdependence in each of these domains would we like to enjoy? How do we strike a balance between mitigating the, the economic and security vulnerabilities inherent in, in sort of the pre-2016 configuration of interdependence without, uh, you know, without overcompensating, without overshooting. Because, because I think that we talk a lot about the vulnerabilities of you know, inherent in interdependence, and those are very real, but there also are benefits. Um, if you look at the United States and China, um, I think that absent, I think that one of the major reasons that the United States and China for for the better part of the past 50 years, I think that one of the reasons why they were able to not eliminate, but they were at least able to, uh, they were able to uh, overcome to some extent the inherent uh, strategic distrust and ideological uh, suspicion uh, that they had for one another was because of uh, interdependence. And it's important to keep in mind that you know, if you were, if you circle back to sort of the U.S. opening to China, uh, between the U.S. opening to China and the end of the Cold War, you know, the United States had a ma- had one major pretext for strengthening its relationship with China, or at least one overriding pretext for strengthening its relationship with China, and that was a desire to uh, support. Uh, its its containment effort against the Soviet Union. Once the Soviet Union uh, imploded in dramatic fashion, that pretext no longer obtained. And so the United States and China in the in the immediate years after the Cold War, they really didn't have an organic basis for cultivating their relationship. Uh, the, again, the Soviet Union was gone, so that pretext was, was gone. Um, and the United States and China, they obviously have very different approaches to domestic governance. They have very different conceptions of world order. They have very different, uh, they have very different understandings of history, very different timelines of history. And so given that in the immediate years after the Cold War, there was basically very little organic basis for cultivating ties, economic, the, the, the cultivation of economic interdependence, it was a contrivance, but it was a very powerful contrivance that helped to uh, push back against some of the inbuilt strategic distrust and ideological suspicion. So we have to be careful that even as we decouple or disentangle selectively, that we not jettison entirely uh, a dynamic that I think to date has played an important role in stabilizing the, the relationship. And so I think that what the administration is trying to do, and again, it's, it's really difficult, is how do you mitigate some of the vulnerabilities inherent in interdependence without throwing overboard all of the benefits? And I think that we should keep in mind that there are many important benefits that have accrued, not just in terms of not just in terms of stabilizing the relationship on balance, but also if you think about just taking a people to people exchanges, think about the role, uh, you know, think about the, the myriad contributions that, uh, Chinese, Amer- Chinese Americans and members of the Chinese uh, diaspora more broadly, think about their myriad contributions to America's edifice of uh, innovation, uh, America's uh, system of higher education. Those are enormous contributions. And we want to ensure that even as we, um, even as we work to reduce security vulnerabilities and economic vulnerabilities inherent in our interdependence with China, that we don't do so at the cost of driving away members of the Chinese diaspora who play a critical role in undergirding U.S. innovation, that we don't, um, that we don't uh, frown on uh, people-to-people exchanges, educational exchanges, cultural exchanges, scientific exchanges. And so I think that your overall characterization is right. Um, you know, in the previous administration, that is in the, in the Trump administration, you know, the administration, yes, it, it, it wanted to compete more aggressively with China, but I, I think that too often 
uh, in the very same breath that it announced initiatives to compete with China, um, it also targeted longstanding allies and partners. And so the Trump administration, it impo- just to give one example, it imposed tariffs on, on Chinese exports, but it also imposed tariffs on exports coming from many allies and partners. The, administ- the Trump administration, it you know, it imposed significant measures to go after, say, Huawei and SMIC, but it also imposed measures that targeted major companies in, uh, in in allies and partners. And so I think the result was that even U.S. allies and partners that were sympathetic to the Trump administration's efforts to compete more aggressively with China, many of them said, well, hey, you know, why, why are we getting up and why are we getting caught up in the crosshairs of your efforts? You know, why are you, why are you going after us at the same time as you're going after China? So I think that the, the Biden Harris administration is trying to recalibrate. It's a very difficult balance. Uh, I think that, you know, China's, I think that China's actions vis-a-vis Taiwan are, are going to make it politically that much more difficult for the administration to recalibrate. But nonetheless, I think that that recalibration will continue because, again, uh, the United States and China, for all of the talk about decoupling, I think that the rhetoric around decoupling substantially outpaces the reality. These are two countries that remain substantially intertwined. Look, just to give one example, in 2021, two-way goods trade between the United States and China was roughly $100 billion U.S., that is, $100 billion uh, U.S. dollars higher than it was in 2019. If you look at major Wall Street firms, major Wall Street firms, they're doubling down in China. They're not they're not exiting China. They're doubling down. And so I think that the entanglement between the two countries is here to stay in substantial fashion. So the question is, how do you strike that balancing act? There are no silver bullets. There are no uh, buzzwords or catchy formulas. This is going to be a, I think, a decades long uh, undertaking to figure out uh, what the Goldilocks formula of interdependence looks like and how to operationalize it. Um, Ali, uh, just as we get the business end of the podcast, I want to start coming to uh, your own uh, authorship. You spend a lot of time looking at great power competition and you've said, you know, I mean, in this day and age of hyper connectedness, do we really see US-China rivalry as a zero-sum game? As you rightly pointed, US-China trade war in some ways is for a lot of countries like Singapore could be a scenario of two warring elephants uh, tussling at each, each other and the rest of the emerging market world could be the grass that they get crust cut on. Sure, sure. So I, you know, actually, I think that this question is, it is, is really important. Um, and I think that, you know, you mentioned Singapore and Singapore, I, I think is always, you know, Singapore, it, it has long punched above its weight uh, diplomatically uh, and economically. And I think that Singapore, it's one of a, I would say it's one of a, a rapidly diminishing set of countries that I, I think enjoys equal credibility with and equal access to uh, the United States and China. And so I think that when, when leaders of Singapore speak, I, I think that uh, leaders in both Washington and Beijing should pay heed. And I, I think if you look at the position that the Singaporean prime minister has articulated, the positions that prominent uh, Singaporean, diplomat, Singaporean diplomats have articulated, the position is basically that uh, Singapore has to you know, Singapore is concerned by the continued deterioration of the U.S.-China relationship. Singapore does not want to be forced to make a choice between Washington and Beijing. Singapore values its relationships with the United States and China for different reasons, but it attaches great priority or it attaches great importance to both of those relationships. And I think that that position, that that desire to avoid a choice, and more importantly, uh, more importantly, more important than I think the desire to avoid a choice is increasingly the belief that such a choice is a false one, that such a choice doesn't really need to be made. Now, in an extreme scenario, in sort of the worst case scenario in which, say, the United States and China go to war over Taiwan, I think it would become all but impossible to say we're not going to make a choice and sit on the sidelines. You would have to make a choice. But I think it's short of those uh, extreme scenarios, I think that many countries reject the note, reject the proposition that they will, in due course, have to make a choice. Uh, and it's not just Singapore. Look at uh, look at Indonesia. Indonesia will be hosting uh, the G20 summit in Bali uh, later uh, later this year. You look at the statements from the Indonesian president. The Indonesian president has said very clearly. Um, we Indonesia, we want to be friends with everyone. That includes the United States. That includes China. We don't ha- want to have to make a choice. Um, you know, you look at statements from, uh, you know, one statement uh, or two, I'll, I'll give sort of two statements that I find. And, and I should say, 
I think that the view of Singapore, the view of Indonesia vis-a-vis, you know, U.S.-China competition, I, I think that that view, the, those views are, are held very widely. Um, I'll give two quotes, or I'll paraphrase them rather, um, two quotes that I think uh, capture the sentiment very well. One comes from, and, now, and I should say importantly, you know, they... Uh, they they predate a lot of the current tensions between the United States and China. They predate sort of, I think, the worst of the coronavirus pandemic. They predate, I think, a lot of China's sort of wolf, uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. But they, nonetheless, I think that the basic sentiments still hold, and I think that they're worth articulating here. The first comes from former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Uh, he gave a lecture to a UK think tank in 2020, I'm forgetting the exact date, but it, at some point in 2020, he gave the, the address virtually because of uh, COVID-related uh, travel restrictions. And then Prime Minister Scott Morrison, he said that too often uh, outside observers believe that Australia's foreign policy is conceived solely within the prism of U.S.-China competition, as if Canberra doesn't have its own independent conception of its national interest, as though you know Canberra is incapable of articulating its foreign policy without referencing Washington and Beijing. And he said, it's just not true. He said that, yes, the U.S. intensifying strategic competition between the United States and China obviously plays an important role in shaping Australia's foreign policy, but it's not determinative. And he took umbrage at this perception that, you know, Australia was essentially an instrument of strategic competition. Uh, And in a similar vein, uh, a quote that I, or a, a notion or a sentiment that I find even more powerful in this regard um, comes from uh, the External Affairs Minister of India, uh, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar. So in 2019, now again, this is pre coronavirus pandemic, it's pre Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's pre uh, sort of China's so called wolf warrior diplomacy. So a lot has obviously transpired, but his basic sentiment, so far as I can gather, hasn't really changed. So in 2019, uh, External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar, he gave an interview to Der Spiegel, I believe it was Der Spiegel, uh, a German outlet, and his interlocutor said, um, you know, Mr. Minister, uh, there are many observers in the West who believe that India will play an increasingly important role in joining sort of a Western-led, really US-led, US-led coalition to counterbalance China. You know, what are your thoughts? And He responded by, he said, I take, I'm I'm paraphrasing him, but he said roughly, he said, I take umbrage at the question and I find it rather demeaning. He said, India is a proud country of well over 1 billion people with a booming economy, a booming military, uh, booming uh, diplomatic ties all over the world. Uh, India is playing uh, an ever greater role in shaping international institutions and shaping multilateral agreements. You know, we're a proud country. And, and I believe actually just a week ago, uh, India recently overtook the United Kingdom to become the world's fifth largest economy. Uh, that, that's 2022, but he was talking in 2019. But his point was, he said, he said, my job is to advance India's national interests and to advance India's foreign policy as I see fit. Uh, I don't see India as being an instrument of any other country. And so India will... Uh, India will cultivate its relationships as it sees fit and as is appropriate. But he said, India is not a pawn on any uh, grand strategic chessboard. India is not an instrument of any particular competition. India is here to advance India's national interests. India is a proud country. And I think that if you look at those statements by, you know, uh, the external affairs minister of India, uh, Australia's former prime minister, Scott Morrison, if you look at more recent statements by the prime minister of Singapore, the president of Indonesia, I think that all of those basically convey the zeitgeist that prevails across much of the world, which is that, look, we recognize that the United States and China are two hugely important players in world affairs. Their rivalry will increasingly shape geopolitics, but we do not feel that we Uh, should be forced to make a choice. We do not believe that such a choice necessarily exists. Uh, We do not want to be instrumentalized within this ever expanding great power competition. We want to be seen as independent actors possessed of full agency. And I think that it's very important for policymakers in both Washington and Beijing to pay heed to those sentiments, to recognize the ubiquity um, of those sentiments and to act accordingly. Ali, as my, my penultimate question, uh, two things you said. One is China 
can be emulated but not replicated. This is interesting because China's manufacturing is based on replication in bulk. So perhaps the first part is what do you mean by emulated but not replicated? And the second part is you said we are not in a cold war because you and rightly so, because China is more integrated in the global economy. There is synergy in economic links and cultural ties, which wasn't in the Soviet Union. But the security paradigm and the distrust between Washington and Beijing and the lacuna that's only growing. Well, it may not be a cold war 2.0, but it's something else. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, both. You know, both very, very difficult, very difficult questions, but also very important questions. I think, you know, on the first, I guess, uh, in terms of sort of, you know, emulation, I mean, emulation, you know, versus, you know, replication, I think, at least from a U.S. perspective, um, you know, I, I say, you know, I've, I've said sometimes, and in particular, I'm drawing on an article that I wrote uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Jessica Chen Weiss. Uh, Jessica Chen Weiss, she recently uh, completed a fellowship, uh, a CFR fellowship uh, that had her serving on the uh, policy planning staff of the State Department. And she now has returned to Cornell, where she's a, uh, a distinguished professor in the political science department. And we wrote an article a couple of years ago in which we said that the United States should not try to out China China. Uh, and the idea is that, you know, the United States is the United States is unique. China is unique. The United States has uh, its own economic model. China has its own economic model. And, you know, the United States is not going to be able to uh, exercise its influence th the same way that China does. And that's not, I don't think it's good or bad on balance. I think it's just sort of a statement of a fact. And so what I've, what I've argued is that the United States is to try as hard as possible to identify, uh, identify, hone and repurpose its unique competitive advantages at home and abroad. So whether, whether it's, uh, it's ecosystem of innovation, whether it's its system of higher education, whether it's, uh, its ability to attract extraordinary talent from around the world to to set up shop in the United States and attend school, set up businesses and abroad. I think that it should um, it should be strengthening its core alliances and partnerships. It should be refurbishing its diplomatic network, which I think is really externally is the um, the uh, indispensable uh, ingredient of its uh, external influence. So so I think to your first question, uh, you know, I would say that the United States, it can't out China, China. It shouldn't try to out China, China, uh, it really should try to become a better version, uh, a more dynamic version of its best self. I think that's really you know key. Uh, on the second question on the Cold War, now I, I hasten to note, analogies have a lot to, to teach us. Uh, and the Cold War, uh, the Cold War's appeal as an analogy is, is self-evident. Uh, America's only, America's only example of, uh, of multifaceted, global long-term strategic competition, it's the Cold War. It's competition with the Soviet Union. And that competition was, it, it was multifaceted, it was global, it was long-term. And so you, you see the appeal of, of the analogy, but um, I think that sometimes there's a risk of overlearning from history and there's a risk of trying to refract uh, contemporary experiences too narrowly through the prism of, of historical uh, uh, historical uh, experiences. And so I think the one critical difference between, uh, and you mentioned sort of the size of, of uh, or you mentioned the level of China's integration of the global economy. And I think that that's, that's an important point of, that's an important uh, distinction between the two episodes. So during the Cold War, the United States faced one external competitor, the Soviet Union. Today, you know, Russia is, well, let, let's say the United States broadly faces, you know, two principal nation state competitors as opposed to one. So it faces uh, China and Russia. I think Russia is sort of a more acute short-term challenge. China is a more systemic long-term challenge. But nonetheless, during the Cold War, the United States faced one principal uh, external competitor. Today, the United States faces two. During the Cold War, the United States was relatively ascendant vis-a-vis -vis that competitor. Today, America's relative influence is declining. Uh, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union at its peak, in, mind you, at its peak, um, if you look at estimates from economic historians, they say that the Soviet Union at its peak, its gross domestic product was roughly between 40 and 45 percent as large as that of the United States. Today, leaving aside uh, Russia, China already has an economy that's roughly four, uh, four fifths as large as that of the United States. So China is, is a much, uh, it's a far more formidable 
economic competitor, as you said, it's far more integrated economically. It's also far more integrated diplomatically than the Soviet Union was. So I think that there's another important difference. Um, I think that during the Cold War, uh, geo- yes, there was a substantial non-aligned movement, but I think the geopolitics, it tended to be more rigid uh, during the Cold War. Um, it was very difficult for for many countries that allied themselves. So if you were if you were aligned with the United States, it was very difficult for you to to do business uh, in the in the capacious sense of the term. So economic business, military business, diplomatic business, it was very difficult for you to double deal. Uh, you either placed your you either threw in your lot. If you weren't part of the non-aligned movement, you either threw in your lot with the United States or you threw in your lot with the Soviet Union. I think that today, um, I think the geopolitics is just, it's a lot more fluid. It's a lot messier. And so so much so uh, that even countries that are longstanding allies and partners of the United States that have grave apprehensions about uh, China's conduct and intentions uh, they are not going to decouple themselves fully from China, in part because they can't realistically do so, but also in part because they recognize that the complexity of diplomacy and the complexity of managing transnational challenges, the complexity of managing global interdependence, requires you to to maintain to maintain a baseline of diplomatic to maintain a, a baseline of overall interaction, even with countries whose internal and external conduct you might find loathsome. You know, we're talking about China, but I think that Russia is a good example. If you look at Russia, um, the vast majority of the world's countries have declined to sanction Russia for its aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, there are, you know, many countries that that uh, are appalled by what they see unfolding in Ukraine, but they want to capitalize on discounted supplies of Russian energy. So I think that another critical difference between the Cold War and today is that I think that today's geopolitics, it's much messier, it's much more fluid. Uh, I think that it's going to be very difficult to, it's going to, it'll be very difficult for the United States to assemble a coalition of fellow advanced industrial democracies that marches in lockstep against China and Russia. I think that the United States will have to accept that certain countries, uh, certain allies and partners, they will meet the United States. uh, They they will align with the United States much more strongly on certain issues and in certain contexts, but they will be that they will not be as aligned with the United States on other issues and in other contexts. And so I think today's geopolitics is much messier. I'll just, I'll just, you know, enumerate one other I think important difference between, or I shouldn't say difference, but I'll I'll articulate one or present one other reason why I think we shouldn't lean in too much to the Cold War analogy. And that is, you know, I mentioned earlier that in America's prior confrontations with external competitors, they had decisive resolution. So I mentioned Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany, they suffered cataclysmic military defeats and the Soviet Union, its regime collapsed in, in quite spectacular fashion. Now, as I said earlier, I don't think that one, one of course, can't theoretically rule out the possibility that the Chinese Communist Party might collapse or that there might be some calamitous war between the United States and China in which the United States decisively emerged on top and China was irreversibly defeated. But I think that those scenarios are kind of tail end scenarios. I don't think that they're the more likely scenarios. I think that the more likely scenario is that China, despite its myriad socioeconomic challenges, despite an increasingly contested external environment, I think that the probability is likely that China will endure in perpetuity and that the United States and China will have to cohabitate. And so if you accept that hypothesis that China is likely to endure in perpetuity, then the question becomes not how do you agitate for China's internal collapse or how do you press for a war in which China will suffer a decisive defeat, but rather how do you, how do you forge, cultivate and sustain an ambiguous, strained and indecisive cohabitation? And and that, that mandate calls for a very, it calls for a very different kind of diplomacy than the diplomacy that was practiced than the, the diplomacy that the United States practiced during the cold war. So again, There is a lot that the United States can learn from the Cold War. There uh, is a lot the United States should learn from the Cold War. Um, I'll give one one lesson that I think the United States should learn from the Cold War. Uh, In the immediate years after the Cold War, uh, the United States, um, it undertook a number of initiatives that while strengthening America's competitive position vis-a-vis the Soviet Union, they could be justified on their own merits without having to invoke Moscow. So the Marshall Plan is a good example, or uh, the United States' establishment of the Bretton Woods post-war order institutions. Again, they strengthen America's competitive edge vis-a-vis the Soviet Union, but they could be justified on their own merits. And I think that similarly today, the United States, as it competes 
principally with China, but also to a lesser extent Russia, it should be thinking of initiatives that it can stand up, uh, coalitions that it can stand up, uh, organizations that it can stand up that will strengthen its competitive edge over the long term vis-a-vis China and Russia, but that don't require it to invoke uh, China and Russia to justify them. So that is, I think, an important lesson that the United States should take from the Cold War. But I think that on balance, in light of some of the, the considerations that I've just mentioned, I think that the United States is going to have to forge a substantially different competitive playbook than the one that it Uh, pursued during the Cold War. And I don't think that that's cause for despair. Uh, I think if anything, it's uh, it's cause for, uh, I would say, creativity and excitement. I think it's 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 a great opportunity for the United States to forge a different strategic playbook, a more durable playbook, a more nimble playbook, and one that will hopefully serve it well, not only in competing with China and Russia, but one, a playbook that will serve it well, regardless of which external competitors arise. Ali, last but no no means least. We speak about great power competition, but perhaps the most important power is soft power. And you spent a lot of time with Joe Nye, the famous Harvard academic, for, for codifying the term soft power. And I think that's where America dominates over China uh, from the 80s and 90s. It was Hollywood, MTV, McDonald's that told the American story. Uh, today, we may say the rise of Netflix, the Silicon Valley giants, Wall Street. But more importantly, the American dream, one may argue in the Trump era, it eroded. But there was still a belief that you could come here and make it. And America has had every hyphenated identity from Algerian American to Zimbabwean American. There's no such Chinese dream that exists for you and me, no matter how much we may know China or how well we may speak Mandarin. You and I can't be Chinese. So is that where the U.S. will forever and always be at the pantheon of countries as we know it? So I... It, it... I, I have to, since since you asked the question, I'll I'll just give my own personal example. Uh, I'm I'm a son of immigrants. My sister is uh, is a daughter of immigrants. Uh, my you know my parents were born in Pakistan. My sister and I were born in the United States. But you know my parents they they can't they left Pakistan in their twenties and they settled in the United States. Mind you, you know they they didn't know where they were going to find work. They didn't know too many people uh, in the United States, but they were so they were so impelled by the American idea, the idea that regardless of where, where on this great earth you were born, that you can, uh, you can join, that you can come to the United States, you can contribute to writing the next chapter of the American story. They were so motivated by that idea that they took that huge leap of faith. And, you know, when I was younger, when my parents talked about leaving Pakistan and moving to the United States, when I was a little kid, I, I appreciated the gravity of their sacrifice in the abstract, but I didn't really appreciate it in in concrete, granular terms. It's only now, as I'm as I'm becoming, as I'm getting older, and as I'm as I'm getting more settled uh, geographically, professionally, and otherwise, it's only now that I'm appreciating the gravity of the sacrifice they made, and therefore appreciating the power of the American idea. I would argue the enduring power of the American idea. So I, I wanted to give that that personal anecdote. And then in response to your question, I do think that that distinction is a powerful source of competitive advantage for the United States. Now, I don't want to sound overly sanguine. I don't want to sound overly Pollyanna-ish. Uh, competitive advantages are not written into the America's competitive advantages. They're not written into America's constitution. They have to be maintained. They have to be preserved. They have to be strengthened. And yet, uh, and I think that America's soft power has been substantially eroded in recent years. And I don't know that the United States will ever be able to reclaim the the allure uh, that it once possessed. Um for for many reasons, whether it's it's mismanagement of the coronavirus pandemic, uh, growing income and wealth inequality, uh, systemic racism, you know, we could go on and on. But having having entered all of those caveats, uh, I think that the the premise of your question is is undeniable, uh, and it gets to you know I mentioned earlier the the sage council that comes from uh, Singapore's leaders, past and present. Lee Kuan Yew, when he was alive, you know, he was often asked, "Do you, Mr. Prime Minister, do you think?" And then when he later stepped down as prime minister and became a minister mentor, so he was asked, you know, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, uh, Minister Mentor, do you think that China will ever overtake the United States for global preeminence? And he often answered, he said that, you know, China's catching up in many ways. It's catching up economically. It 
And as it catches up economically, it will develop a more formidable military. But he says that the United States has one enduring competitive advantage that China will find very difficult to replicate. And that is, um, if you were born outside of China, it's very difficult to become Chinese in the sense, you know, you can learn, you, you can, you can uh, settle in China, you can work in China, you can achieve near native level proficiency in Chinese, but you will always be seen as an outsider. You will never fully become Chinese. And the consequence of that is that China in earnest can draw on the talents of roughly 1.4 billion people. That is China's population. He says the United States can draw on the population, can draw on the talents uh, and the energy and the dreams of the entire world. Because the United States basically says that you don't have to have been born in the United States. So long as you believe in America's foundational creed, we in the United States, we invite you to come here, to attend our schools, to establish businesses here, to contribute to writing the next chapter of the American story. And so when you can draw on the talent of the entire world, uh, and when everyone can become American, not only those who were born in the United States, that's an extraordinary competitive advantage. And it's not clear to me that China can readily replicate that competitive advantage. And in fact, I would argue that it's going to become harder for China to replicate that competitive advantage. If you look at some of the steps that China is taking at home and abroad, uh, China's uh, Chinese authoritarianism uh, domestically is intensifying. Uh, China's crackdown on foreign non-governmental organizations, foreign uh, you know, businesses is intensifying. And China's so fo- so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, which is estranging Uh, many advanced industrial democracies that might funnel talent to China, uh, China is doubling down on that counterproductive course of diplomacy. So I think that if China ever did have the ability to replicate that competitive advantage that the United States possesses, I think that that if China ever did have that potential, I think that China is undercutting that potential. And so I think, you know, just to sort of to some, you know, just to wrap up, I, you know, I would argue that no, we're not, you know, we're not living in 1992 the United States is unlikely to ever regain the, the relative preeminence that it enjoyed 30 years ago. Yes, China is far more able today and far more willing today to push back against U.S. Uh, influence. But I, I think that it's important for the United States, you know, complacence is one danger, but so is consternation. Uh, as, the, as the old quip goes, China is strategically, it's not two feet tall, but it's not 10 feet tall. I think that the, it, I think it behooves the United States to take a deep breath, Uh, And to avoid declinism, to avoid fatalism, to take stock of the myriad competitive advantages that it enjoys, many of which are unique, uh, and to get down to the hard work of renewing those competitive advantages at home and abroad, recognizing that China is going to be an enduring multifaceted competitor, but recognize, but, but, but realizing as well that the United States is not a is not a trivial power in its own right. It is a serious, multifaceted power that is likely to endure. But let's to get down to the hard work of renewing our competitive advantages at home and abroad. Let's right size the competitive challenge from China. Let's also take stock of China's competitive liabilities so that we don't end up uh, so that we don't end up. Uh, being drawn into or or goaded into a defensive reactionary policy that speaks more to our anxieties than to our aspirations. And with that, we bring this episode to a close. If you like what you're hearing, kindly give us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell a friend. So until next time on The Global Detail. This podcast has been a production of Carcutta Media in association with Perspicacity Media, LLC. All guest views are their own. If you have any questions, thoughts, or concerns, email us at globaldetailpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can contact us on Facebook and Twitter at Global Detail Pod. This recording or any portion thereof may not be reproduced or used in any manner whatsoever without the express written permission of the publisher, except for the use of brief quotations in a review. Copyright 2022 by Calcutta Media LLC. All rights reserved. <laughs>